for welcoming me. Um, I'll be happy to tell you a little bit about sleepwalking. Sleepwalking, we all, I would say a large percent of the population have experienced that uh, at, some, at some point in their life, but everything is in the brain. You see a picture of a brain, around the brain are different stages of sleep. On the left side are the light stages of sleep. On the right side are the deep stages of sleep. Each stage is sensed by the brain waves. It has a characteristic. Parasomnia, that is a conglomerate of, we call it disorders of arousal, I don't want to complicate the terminology, but sleepwalking is included in that. And sleepwalking originates in a deep sleep stage. We call it stage three. All right, I don't want to get more into that. So there are different, there are two types of sleep periods. And they are classified according to your eye movements. When your eyes move fast, it's rapid eye movements. And when that doesn't happen, it's no REM. The sleepwalking originates precisely when the eyes do not move fast. In other words, in no REM sleep. There is a specific disorder that occurs in rapid eye movements that is very uncommon and is not very pleasant when happen. That is called REM behavior disorder. And I want you to keep that in your mind when you see this movie. That disorder it occurs mostly in patients that are 60 uh, years old and above. Sometimes it occurs in young people. One of the causes is medication. Sometimes we don't know it's idiopathic. But the main characteristic of this is like a very vivid dreams that can be dangerous for the patient and for the person who sleeps with the patient. Very important, another important characteristic is that the patient remembers this very clearly after he wakes up. So sleepwalking, again, is mostly, no, it mostly occurs of all the time in non-REM sleep. This is a very common disorder. It is described as an abnormal behavior, abnormal motor behavior that includes ambulation. That means, of course, walking. There's a lack of awareness, no collection of memory. I mean, no memory of, the, of why they were doing what, what occurs. Sometimes it can be just a routine, like try to prepare food. Eyes are open. Undesirable behaviors also can occur. Sometimes are dangerous. No memory of event, as I mentioned before, and it only lasts a few minutes. So this is what we do in our hospital. We have um, our sleep lab where the text connects the patient to different sensors. We can put sensors on the scalp to see the brain waves and see how you sleep, what stage you are. We have sensors in the skin close to the muscles so we can see if your muscles increase in tone or not increase in tone. Very important characteristic of rapid eye movement of sleep is a decrease in the muscle tone. We also check your breathing. We put like a bell on your chest. And we have sensors for the airflow. So we can diagnose many, all the sleep, most of the sleep disorders with this comprehensive test. And the most common one, and the one that you all familiar is sleep apnea, that I'm not gonna talk about in this lecture. But the sleep apnea is important because it's common in the adulthood and can be a precipitating factor for sleepwalking. Other precipitating factors is sleep deprivation or lack of enough sleep, medications, alcohol withdrawal, illnesses. Um, before going to so stage three and four, again, it is when occurs sleepwalking. And it's triggered from the transition from deep sleep to light sleep. And I'm going to repeat one more time. What triggers are lack of sleep, medications, etc. So how can we diagnose this? Of course, we can do a sleep study, but there's a possibility you won't capture anything. 
just with a good history, you can make a diagnosis and see if it's really worth it to do a sleep study. The treatment, most important is safety for the patient, whoever sleeps with the patient. Um, sleep hygiene, we call it like good sleep habits. Like avoid the computer late at night, avoid your cell phone alarms or notification of your cell phone. That can really produce an auditory stimuli that then is going to make you wake up in the middle of the night. And eliminate triggers like lack of sleep and in some patients investigate for sleep apnea. The, finally, uh, it is important because there have been uh, criminal cases associated with this disorder and people can be acquitted. Uh, we, there's a phenomenon called sexomnia where there is a crime committed and the patient doesn't have any recollection and you can demonstrate that with some clinical feature and features of a sleep study. So it requires all the time expert opinion. Homicidal sleepwalking, there have been famous cases in the history and that's what I think is, is very important. And I'm sure you're gonna enjoy the movie for the examples it's gonna show you. This is a very short time to explain you in detail the complexity of this, uh, of this conglomerate of behaviors that occur with parasomnia. Other parasomnia, is gonna end this uh, conversation, is um, like a sleep talking. You can have also, um, there's some emotional expression that occur, like crying, screaming. All these are part of parasomnias. And again, the one that we talk here is sleepwalking. Any question, please? At this point, um, we'll start the movie momentarily, uh, but we have Dr. Salmon right here, so if you have any questions about sleepwalking or about sleep in general, is that your disposal? Yes, ma'am. Please. <laughs> You, you yes, so for a, for a sleep apnea, there are two types of tests. First of all, you need to have the symptoms to order the test. So there's a home sleep test that you only put like a cannula in your nose. You use a belt and you use like a little sensor in the, in the, on the finger. Mm -hmm. So it will sense the airflow. It will detect a blockage of the airflow it will sense an effort of your breathing because you don't get in air and that then will follow by dropping your oxygen. That's an event and everything goes to a box that will record. So if we have five or more, then it's called a sleep apnea. Uh, the other test that I described is a very comprehensive test that is only done in the hospital yeah. and that can diagnose more things like a parasomnia if it occurs that night, because there might be a possibility it won't happen that night, and it will be completely normal. So when you send somebody who has sleepwalking or any other kind of abnormality during sleep, you wanna make sure that happens very often. Otherwise, you can treat the patient without going through the sleep test in the, in the, in the hospital. Is that you know, a good answer, or you want, <laughs> uh, is there anything else? Oh, so you experience the whole, oh, yeah. it's like a whole process. Oh, yeah. All these wires that go in your body and, yeah. and so on. It's a quiet process. Can be uncomfortable. Sometimes you won't sleep enough no, because, sleep okay, in your case it worked. <laughs> I hope all the patients are like that. Great. Yes. Before the film, can you give us some context about what a typical sleep night is like? For the film. Like a sleep night is like, and what was the last thing she said? Or uh, just how it occurs. Okay, um, in the setting of a sleepwalking, or just a normal person? In general, normal person. Okay, so when you fall asleep normally, you go to light stages until you go to deep stages, and then you enter into non into REM sleep. That means rapid eye movement. That's where the dreams happen. That's the stage where dream happens. You usually have four of these or three of these through the night. All these cycles, four or three cycles through night. That's normal. For the sleepwalking, it usually happens on the first third of a night. At the end of the night, we'll see 
this a very abnormal pathology that is called REM behavior disorder that is very, again, I'm going to say one more time, it's very uncommon. Um, I want you to keep that in mind when you see the movie. <laughs> okay, I cannot tell you about the movie, but just keep that in mind. But yes, dreams happen usually at the end of the night. Sleepwalking, of course, the first third of the night. Yes? How does it relate to, sleepwalking relate to um, Lewy body dementia, where it, when you're sleeping, usually you dream and we're paralyzed and we don't act out our dreams, but in Lewy body dementia, that mechanism, whatever it is, isn't working, so people act out their dreams, they may get their partner or they may Yes, very interesting question, uh, and I'll be happy to answer that. And Lewy body dementia, Parkinson, and multisystemic sclerosis, and I'm, I'm, these are degenerative brain diseases. Parkinson, Lewy body dementia, it actually can occur mostly in the pontine, in the base of the brain. That's where rapid eye movement of sleep originates. So when you have REM behavior disorder, it is a predictor, predictor of Lewy body dementia, a predictor of Parkinson. That's what it is when this, you get that diagnosis, you have to have a serious conversation with the patient. Again, there are cases that very few that that's not the case and could be also from medications such as antidepressant because they alter all these substances that circulate in the brain. But yes, it's, it's a predictor of, of that uh, dementia, unfortunately. Yes? I'm glad I got questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I had a conversation with a friend actually a few weeks ago about sleepwalking, um, mm -hmm. and they told me that, I don't know if this is true or not, but if I'm asking, like, if someone's sleepwalking, like, you're not meant to, like, wake them up, like, you're supposed to kind of just let them do their thing and just kind of just wake up on their own, like, one, is that true, and, like, two, like, why, why wouldn't you want to wake someone up, like, while they're sleepwalking? That's, uh, that's something that I was in reading about it because there's but it's not that the patient is going to die but you imagine did you wake up somebody just don't know what is what I'm doing here uh, it's going to be scared I can't react aggressively so what you need to do is to guide that person gently to the bed back to bed <laughs> I have patients that actually had a sleepwalking and they are getting up sometimes out of the house and they, they turn on the car and they can get injured. Uh, I mean, these behaviors can, they don't get to the high level of complexity, but sometimes you'll be surprised. And the most important is the safety. That you have safety measures. You know, take away all weapons around, sharps, <laughs> when that happens, and you'll see something like that in the movie. Yes. Is there any other question? Yes, the last one, I guess. Yeah. Um, are sleep disorders inherited? Yes, uh, there's some genetic predisposition for sleepwalking. You will hear people say, oh, you know, my, my brother has this, and, or my, my grandma is also sleepwalking or so on. There's some genetic predisposition. But not that doesn't mean that everybody who has a family member or you know, first degree family members want to have that. I hope I answered that question. Yes? <clears> the <throat> question is more about just having difficulty sleeping and mm -hmm. taking sleep medication. Um, Ambient, for example. <clears throat> and what, what are some of the side effects of that? And I, I know somebody personally has been taking it every night for years. The choice they make is, I know it's dangerous, potentially, but I don't sleep without it. That's a very complex problem because it's something that's going on for a while. And there's a black, bo black box warning on ambient that can precipitate sleepwalking, parasomnias. They say parasomnias. And people have injured. And I personally, not only personally, but it's recommended you don't give that for more than a week or 10 days. 
Uh, now you're taking that every day and you kind of sleep with it. Maybe uh, what is effective for insomnia is called cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, it's going to be a, you know, a lot of work, but you may be able to, uh, uh, to work it out through weeks or months. Uh, here at Yukon Health, we have a PhD actually, uh, from, that is expert in insomnia, and uh, that would be a good candidate for, for that friend that you have. But yes, people can fall, and it can be dangerous. Um, do you think that uh, sleep apnea, the incidence of sleep apnea is increasing? Yeah, well, good question. It's, it's also, I can say yes, if I only correlate sleep apnea with uh, increasing obesity in the population, the general population, but every area of the United States is different. Um, I would just say yes, but depends also the degree of the sleep apnea, the severity. When you have, I can tell you maybe like, without, I cannot see you guys very well because of the lights you get into <laughs> my eyes, and I cannot make any discrimination at this moment, but I can tell you with certainty that there's a prevalence of 20% or 30%. Prevalence is like, you know, it's not like a new case, but it's what it is in the, the period of time. But um, it, mild sleep apnea, if you don't have symptoms, you don't need treatment, you don't need CPAP, you don't need, you, she's not treated. But if you have, a, um, if you have moderate sleep apnea, you need some treatment. On also with weight loss. And not every sleep apnea is associated with, with overweight. I have patients that are, you know, athletes that are very skinny and have a sleep apnea. It's a very complex, complex um, I would say, pathophysiology because it can be anatomic. I mean, the shape of your airway. It can be the, how the muscles react when you sleep. It can be uh, medications the patients are on. It can be the patients are on opioids. There's so many things that can be going on. But yes, the incidence, I think, is increasing. Also, keep that in mind that we're actually making more sleep studies, more sleep testing. So we uncover more cases that we weren't doing that 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So it's a, it's a moving target. OK? Any other questions? I hope you, yes, you have one more? Yes, we do. So I haven't seen the film, but I've seen the trailer, and it sounds like the, the microbilia, he is getting sleepwalking because he's really stressed out. Can being stressed out lead to sleepwalking, or is it just like a being stressed out means you're going to sleep less, means you can have disturbances that will lead to sleepwalking? Uh, I forgot to put that on my slide, mm -hmm. but a lot of stress can happen. You see sleepwalking, a little bit of incidence in the you know, in college students or people who are doing a, uh, a test, uh, and the stress can, can give you some triggers of sleepwalking. Not, not everybody's going to have a sleepwalking. I don't say it right, happens right. to everybody, but if you have that predisposition, it can trigger that, yeah. for sure. Uh, well, but he dis it's a little confusing what he, he about the movie, yeah. but at the end you will get an answer. Um, I don't think that what, you know, there's, there's a, something that is called overlap, that means you can have a combination <laughs> of, of non-REM with REM. Uh, and it's, it's hard to say, he, you know, it's easy to say, well, you know what, he has this disorder. But in the case that is, you know, described or shown in the movie, it, it's going to be very difficult to put it like in the context of a, of a, of a real patient. Um, so I lead to your <laughs> criteria to. <laughs> to see what really is going on with this patient. But again, I think I, I really like your question about the uh, body, uh, the dementia, and what is the importance about this uh, uh, dream and nightmare path pathology that occurs in, in rapid eye movement sleep. Okay, enjoy the movie. Thank you. Thank you.